Buenos Dias, Redeemer! Einen wunderschönen guten Morgen, Redeemer! <lacht> guten Morgen, Redeemer! Guten Morgen! Good morning, Redeemer! Äh. <lacht> Sorry, Mary! <lacht> ähm, einen wunderschönen guten Morgen, Redeemer! Goedemorgen, fijn dat je er weer bij bent bij het Nederlandstalige Dienst van Redeemer. Het is vandaag de laatste keer dat we in dit formaat de dienst gaan, gaan zien. Um, dus de, de kinderkamers hier waar we zijn of de studeerkamers van Christo dadelijk gaan verwisseld worden volgende week. Omdat we weer naar een nieuwe kerk kunnen gaan met een kleine groep vanaf volgende week. Uh, meer informatie volgt daarover in de, verder van deze dienst of uh, op onze website. Maar we zijn heel enthousiast dat we weer elkaar echt in het echt kunnen gaan zien en met elkaar God kunnen gaan zoeken. Ook al is het nog niet in een hele grote groep. We gaan de dienst livestreamen vanuit de Nieuwe Kerk. Dus vanaf volgende week niet meer een dienst in dit formaat, maar een dienst waarin je meekijkt naar het eerste gedeelte van wat we samen gaan beleven in de Nieuwe Kerk. En je kan nog steeds daarna met mensen uit je livegroep dan thuis verder gaan. God gaan aan bidden en verder gaan met elkaar bemoedigen. Maar vandaag is het de laatste keer in deze setting. Het is een bijzondere tijd geweest de laatste maanden, ik denk wel bijna zes maanden en uh, we hebben veel uh, samen kamers gezien, we hebben veel um, filmpjes zijn er opgenomen door, uh, door jullie en door verschillende mensen, we zijn er hartstikke dankbaar voor, maar we kijken ook weer heel erg uit naar het volgende seizoen, dat we hopelijk weer meer bij elkaar mogen komen en uh, ons mogen we gaan uitstrekken naar wat God wil gaan doen in de stad, in Den Haag en daarbuiten. Nou, we gaan er vandaag God samen zoeken. Ik wil een stukje uit Psalm 33 lezen om de dienst zo mee te beginnen. Er staat, zing een loflied voor de Heer, allen die met God leven. Het is goed om als Gods kinderen hem te loven. Zing een nieuw lied voor de Heer, begeleid door prachtig snarenspel. Want het woord van de Heer is betrouwbaar en uit al zijn daden blijkt zijn trouw. God houdt van oprechtheid en eerlijkheid en de aarde loopt over... Van de goedheid en de liefde van de Heer. Mogen we als Gods kinderen, als we Jezus kennen, hebben ze dadelijk gaan loven. Daarom wil ik je oproepen om creatief te zijn, om echt je gedachten op Hem te gaan richten. Laten we de tijd nemen die voor ons ligt om onze harten te laten veranderen, doordat we Zijn grote liefde gaan zien. Laten we samen bidden. Heer, als we zo onze harten op U richten, bidden we U hier deze morgen dat U Uw liefde en Uw vreugde. Gaat geven in ons. Wilt u door uw Heilige Geest ons aan gaan spreken vandaag? We zijn hier om aangesproken door u te worden. We zijn hier om u te zoeken, Heer. In dit seizoen waar we ook staan, wilt u voor ieder van ons een woord geven vandaag. Door de tijd van aanbidding heen. Misschien zelfs door de afkondiging heen. Of door de preek heen die er gaat volgen, Heer. En we danken u dat we dit niet alleen hoeven te doen. Maar dat we in al onze huizen nu verbonden zijn. Samen in u. We kijken naar uit, Heer, dat u ons binnenkort weer bij elkaar gaat brengen. Maar vanochtend willen we in ieder in zijn eigen plek willen we u gaan prijzen en willen we u gaan loven. We danken u hier voor wie u bent. In Jezus' naam. Amen. Lam van God, u die alle zonden van de wereld droeg, u die ons met God de Vader heeft verzoend. U bent waarde, lam van God. Met uw lichaam is de hoogste prijs betaald. Met uw leven is de weg naar God gebaand. U bent waarde, waardig is uw naam. Waardig is uw naam, hemel en aarde zingen, halleluja. Waardig is uw naam, waardig is uw naam. Jezus, u zij de glorie. Lam van God, dat als het voor 
geslacht. Dat de wil van God de Vader heeft volbracht. U bent waardig. Lam van God.
dat graf is hij gegaan. Maar zie dat graf is nu goed bent, dat u op dit moment bij ons bent, dat u ons vervult met uw nabijheid. Dank u wel Heer, dat we u mogen zien in uw heerlijkheid, als we het kruis zien waar aan u hing, maar ook als we u zien nu in al uw heerlijkheid aan de rechterhand van de Vader. Heer, vul ons met uw vrede, kom bij ons op dit moment. Dank u wel Heer, het is waar Heer Jezus. Wij verwachten u met heel ons hart. U bent degene die ons helpt en ons beschermt. Wij danken u voor wat u gedaan hebt. Kom met uw geest, in Jezus' naam. Amen. We gaan over naar het volgende stuk van de dienst. Heb een goede dienst. Mijn naam is Rachel en ik heb vandaag twee mededelingen voor jullie. Ten eerste, als je nog steeds geen... Um, nog steeds, <laughs> maar nog geen uh, mails ontvangt of updates of uh, dat soort dingen, dan uh, kun je onderaan deze video um, je opgeven daarvoor. En uh, dan kun je in contact uh, blijven met alles wat er gaande is uh, in de kerk. En ten tweede uh, begint deze week vandaag eigenlijk de uh, gebedsweek. Dus dat is uh, vanavond ook van 8 tot 9 en ook door de week. Van 8 tot half 9 en in de middag van kwart voor 1 tot kwart over 1. Um, dat is allemaal onderdeel van de gebedsweek. En in de ochtenden zullen we een YouTube video uh, ja, uploaden en daarin het onderwerp voor het gebed uh, introduceren. En dan uh, op de gebedsmomenten zelf gaan we verder in op dat onderwerp. Dus uh, ja, super leuk als je daar ook bij bent. Super, hartelijk welkom vanochtend. Uh, we hebben een speciale gast vandaag, heet uh, Hans Borghuis. Hans werkt met Stichting De Haven. Uh, stichting De Haven is een stichting uh, dat wij als kerk een hele goede relatie hebben, mee hebben. Hans, help me, hoe zegt, hoe zegt u dat? Um, nou ja, een goede relatie, dat is op zich heel goed omschreven. En we zijn ontzettend blij dat jullie als kerk op die manier aan ons verbonden zijn en achter ons willen staan ook. En op deze manier meeleven met ons werk. Dus fantastisch uh, daarvoor. Dank jullie wel. Nou, super. Well, bedankt voor de help met Nederlands ook. Dit is, uh, je kan mij goed helpen. Uh, Hans, wij willen een beetje meer van jou horen. Wij zijn dankbaar dat je de tijd heeft uh, genomen om, genomen om uh, met ons te zijn. En vertel ons een beetje meer over jou, uh, jouw werk uh, en, en ook uh, over Stichting De Haven. Waarom is Stichting De Haven nodig in, uh, in Den Haag? Ja, uh, nou mijn naam is Hans Borghuis, zoals je al zei. Ik ben verbonden aan Stichting De Haven. Ik werk voor De Haven als uh, relatiemanager en als spreker. En daarbij spreek ik veel in kerken en onderhoud ik ook de relaties met kerken, maar ook met de ondernemers en uh, ja, diverse uh, relaties die aan ons uh, verbonden zijn. Nou, Stichting De Haven is er voor moeders, dochters en zussen in de seksindustrie. Als je kijkt naar een stad als Den Haag, dan praat je al gauw over drie tot 4.000 vrouwen die hier in Den Haag in de seksindustrie uh, werken. De meeste van hen niet uit vrije wil. En we zien mensen die gedwongen zijn door uh, mensenhandelaren. We zien soms mensen die gedwongen zijn door een pooier. Maar heel vaak zien we ook vrouwen die vanwege pure armoede 
in de seksindustrie, in de prostitutie zijn terechtgekomen. En uh, vaak zien we vrouwen uit Zuid-Amerika of uit Oost-Europese landen die in Nederland in de seksindustrie zijn terechtgekomen. Vaak ook onder valse voorwenselen, uh, dat wordt ze een baantje beloofd. In een land van herkomst hebben ze vaak geen enkele kans, omdat ze daar ja, ze vaak geen opleiding hebben, er geen werk is en gewoon geen enkele manier is om uh, geld te verdienen. Vaak hebben ze wel een gezin en kinderen te onderhouden en is dit hun enigste manier om aan inkomsten, uh, in inkomsten te voorzien. Nou, wat wij doen als, uh, als Stichting De Haven is dat we deze vrouwen opzoeken, juist op de plek daar waar zij werken. Um, relatie proberen te bouwen, contacten proberen te leggen. Ze dus proberen te helpen met alle handen voorkomende vragen te kunnen vragen zijn rondom belasting, rondom administratie, rondom huisvesting, rondom problemen met kinderen soms. En we proberen zoveel, van deze, zoveel mogelijk van deze vrouwen ook te begeleiden naar een leven buiten de prostitutie. Voor vrouwen die uit de, de prostitutie willen stappen. Nou, dat doen we uh, als organisatie en daarvoor is het ook echt heel erg belangrijk dat we ja, ons gedragen weten, ons gesupport ook weten door, uh, ja, door kerken zoals jullie. Daar zijn we ontzettend blij en ontzettend uh, dankbaar voor ook. Ja, super. We zijn ook uh, dankbaar. We zijn dankbaar voor alles wat jullie uh, voor, voor die vrouwen doen. En uh, wij denken ze echt, ja, bijzonder goed die liefde, die liefde van Jezus praktisch te maken om... Uh, om die vrouwen te helpen en uh, met hun te staan en te ondersteunen. En ja. Uh, ja, wij zijn dankbaar dat wij kunnen iets betekenen in dit. En vertel ons een beetje meer, hoe kunnen wij um, als een kerk meer betekenen? Hoe kunnen mensen um, betrokken, is betrokken? Hoe kunnen mensen betrokken zijn? Of ja, uh, yeah, how can we be connected? Ja, nou um, voor ons als organisatie is het heel belangrijk dat we kerken achter ons hebben staan zoals jullie. Daar zijn we ontzettend dankbaar voor. Maar daarnaast is het ook heel erg belangrijk dat er mensen zijn die ons werk willen ondersteunen met ja, een klein bedrag per maand. Um, hoe meer mensen dat doen, hoe beter wij onze organisatie kunnen bouwen, ook richting de toekomst. En ja, zoals het er nu naar uitziet, uh, zal ons werk voorlopig nog wel nodig zijn. Want ja, de seksindustrie en de prostitutie die draaien en blijven waarschijnlijk voorlopig ook wel draaien. Dus dan is het voor ons erg belangrijk om uh, ons gedragen te weten, ook door particulieren die ons willen ondersteunen met een, uh, met een bedrag per maand. Um, op onze website, een compleet vernieuwde website overigens, die pas online is gegaan, www.dehaven.nl. Uh, ik nodig jullie graag uit om daar een kijkje te komen nemen ook. En daar zit ook een button uh, waarop je ons werk kan ondersteunen. En waarop je kan je gegevens kan achterlaten en een bedrag per maand kan invullen waarmee je ons ondersteunt. En dat is voor ons echt ontzettend belangrijk om ook naar de toekomst toe uh, ons werk te kunnen blijven doen. En om deze, ja, deze vrouwen, deze moeders, deze dochters, deze zussen... Uh, ook in de toekomst te kunnen blijven helpen en te kunnen uh, ondersteunen. Fantastisch. Het is echt leuk dat we kunnen uh, met jullie werken als de kerk. We hebben uh, be- geld um, gegeven als de kerk, maar ik, ik vind het ook leuk dat we kunnen voor jullie bidden. En ook Absoluut. dat mensen in de kerk kunnen hunzelf uh, vrijwilligerswerk doen of, of uh, elke maand misschien uh, ondersteunen financieel. Zo so, ja. Uh, yeah. Wij zijn dankbaar dat wij kunnen met jullie staan. Ja. Uh, we hebben dit net gedaan in Engels. En in Engels heb ik uh, voor jou, uh, um, voor jullie gebeden. Maar in Nederlands, ik vraag, kan, kan u voor ons bidden als de kerk? En uh, dat wij kunnen, ja, yeah, uh, Gods hart voor de stad, Gods hart voor die vrouwen uh, meer krijgen. En ook, ook voor die vrouwen hunzelf. En die vrouwen dat, uh, dat jullie uh, meewerken. Uh, ja. Zeker. Begrijp je goed? Ja, zeker. Nee, helemaal goed. Laten we bidden. Vader, grote en machtige Heer, we danken u Heer voor wie u bent en voor wie u wilt zijn ook. Dank u wel Heer voor deze kerk, voor deze mensen van Redeemer Church in in Den Haag die een hart hebben voor de stad ook en die een hart hebben voor de samenleving van de mensen die in Den Haag leven ook Heer. Dat het uw hart mag zijn, dat het uw liefde mag zijn waarmee ze kijken naar de wereld om om ons heen, de wereld ook van Den Haag en voor iedereen die daar leeft ook. Ja, dank u wel ook voor de betrokkenheid die er is vanuit uh, Redeemer op Stichting De Haven. Heer, en ik wil u bidden of u wilt geven dat ook ja, de mensen van Redeemer op de manier in deze vrouwen, deze moeders, dochters en zussen die in de seksindustrie werken, mogen kijken zoals u dat doet. Met uw ogen, met uw liefde vanuit uw vader had. Ja, dank u wel voor de betrokkenheid die er is. Ik wil u graag bidden voor al die vrouwen die ja, gevangen zitten in de wereld van de prostitutie, die gevangen zitten in de wereld van de seksindustrie. Heren, wilt u een uitweg bieden en wilt u de haven ook zegenen en 
daarvoor ook de middelen geven om dit werk te kunnen doen en te kunnen blijven doen, ook in de toekomst hier. Om uw licht te kunnen verspreiden, om uw liefde te kunnen verspreiden en uw liefde ook te laten zien. Om uw licht te laten schijnen, juist ook in deze donkere wereld, in deze straten van Den Haag en in de um, seksindustrie waar we het over hebben hier. Ik bid om uw zegen voor Redeemer Church, voor alle mensen die betrokken zijn. Ik bid om uw kracht, om uw liefde, om uw vuur. Heer, wilt u hen zegenen, te hen vullen, zodat ze uw licht mogen laten schijnen in Den Haag, in hun omgeving. In Jezus naam. Amen. Amen. Hey, heel erg bedankt Hans. Leuk Jij bedankt, jullie bedankt. Leuk om jou te hebben en uh, hopelijk zie, uh, zien wij je in de korte termijn. Korte. Fantastisch, yes. Hey, tot ziens. Dankjewel, dag. Good morning, Redeemer. Um, I am here because I want to share with you um, my story of recent healing. Um, and it was August 7th, and I was out doing some sporting with a friend and riding my bike and playing tennis. And um, on my way home, my back just completely went out, my back, uh, my lower back, and I had just terrific, horrible pain. Um, so I got home that Friday night and uh, Friday afternoon and um, was in just terrible pain and um, tried to relax and put ice on it and of course praying and um, and uh, but then the pain just got so incredible that um, my husband took me to the emergency room um, he held me as I walked in I could barely walk into the emergency room um, and went to um, the hospital and um, I thank God the doctors was able to see me immediately Um, diagnosed me with severe muscle cramping or muscle spasms in my back and gave me some pain medicine and basically sent me home. Um, but that weekend um, was some of the worst excruciating pain I've ever had. Um, immediately that night, I, I reached out to my prayer warrior friends and had them praying. Um, and I would love to say I was healed miraculously instantly, but it doesn't always happen like that. And so I was really learned a lesson. And so Um, I was, um, the pain kept coming worse at night and the pain was, um, getting progressively worse. I had to take time off of work. Um, and it just didn't seem like any position I could get in would relieve the pain. Um, started physical therapy right away. Um, again, still praying, um, and, and asking for the Lord to heal, started physical therapy exercises, um, went back to see the doctor. Um, again, um, prescribed more um, medication to help with the pain. And I, but I found as, as a couple of days went on, I was praying for healing and the worst pain would be in the morning and I would get up and just pray and walk and ask the Lord to heal. And I'm telling you every morning he would give me what I needed. He would give me the strength for the day. The pain would be taken away. I would be healed. But then the next night the pain would return. And every morning I would come back to the Lord. And this went on for a few weeks um, of me just being fine during the day, doing what I needed to do. The pain would come back at night and every morning he would heal me again and just heal me again and heal me again. And, um, I'm happy to say three and a half weeks later now, I, I truly am completely healed. I almost have no pain. Um, and so the healing has come, but didn't come immediately. So it really taught me, um, yeah, to press into the Lord, to cry out to him, I now look back, I treasure those times when I was just praying and singing in tongues, singing God's word back to him to take the focus off of me, putting it on to the Lord. Um, and just knowing that when we're in pain, these painful situations, I can take my eyes off the pain, put my eyes on the Lord and the healing will come. It doesn't come immediately sometimes, it comes over time, but God has a purpose in that, a purpose in the pain. And I'm just so pleased to say that I am miraculously healed. Um, and he uses medication. He uses doctors. Don't be afraid of that. Um, and just, I just praising God today for all he's done for me and just wanted to share that with you today. Thank you. Hey, Redeemer. Good morning. I'm so glad that you've joined us. If you are new to Redeemer, if you've never watched one of these services before, it's great that you're here. Feel completely at home and relaxed. Well, this is an interesting service because it's the last of what we've had for the last six months 
of pre-recorded uh, services that we put up onto YouTube on a Sunday morning. From next week Sunday, Sunday the 20th of September, we will be gathering again in the Newerkirk, in the center of The Hague. I'm so excited about this. The services are going to look very different. We're calling them gatherings even rather than services. But to have the opportunity to see each other, to worship, to pray, to listen to preaching, to share communion. Man, I'm so excited. It's going to be fantastic. And although there are far less people and the services will be shorter, uh, I just think, man, it's going to be such a wonderful joy to finally be able to meet with one another in person. If anything is unclear to you how the services work up in term, work in terms of signups, etc., please do check on the website and please get in contact with us if anything is unclear to you. We really do want you to know what's happening. For those who are unable or unwilling to meet together physically, uh, we are still going to be streaming part of those services live on YouTube on Sunday mornings. So please make sure that you still check out the services and you don't think, well, I'm not there, so I'm going to miss out. We don't want you to miss out. We want you to still be absolutely a part of things as we move forward. Well, this week is a week of prayer for us as a church. Three times a year, we specifically give ourselves to pray together through this week on each of the mornings, we're going to email you a little video from one of the elders. And it's a video encouraging us as a church to pray through something specific for that day. But we'd also love you to join us in praying in our normal prayer meetings. Through this season, we've been gathering 8 to 8.30 and 12.45 to 1.15, Monday to Friday, just to pray together and also on our Sunday evening. So that's this Sunday evening, 8 o'clock, next Sunday evening, 8 o'clock, particularly these ones around the week of prayer. I'd love you to come and pray with us. These prayer meetings have been fantastic. We felt God speaking, God's been at work, God's been doing wonderful things. I don't want you to miss out from them. So come and join us, especially this week with the week of prayer. One of the things that God's actually spoken to us about through these prayer meetings and in these last weeks is actually about fasting as well. And so this week of prayer, we'd like to introduce the element of fasting. Fasting is a spiritual practice that Jesus spoke about. It. It's, it's denying ourselves something that we would normally have, like food being the most common example, that we would give the time that we'd give to preparing and eating food actually just to prayer. And so some of you radical or hardcore people might be able to fast the whole week. For others, maybe it's fasting lunch times or fasting one day or fasting something that's not food, but takes up a lot of your time. I'd, I'd love to challenge you. Maybe you've never fasted before, but use this time to fast. And while you would have been doing that other thing, why don't you just spend time praying? Fasting without prayer is a hunger strike, so don't go on hunger strike this week, but let's give ourselves the prayer. And I'd love to encourage you to add this element of fasting in. Jesus spoke about it. It's a spiritual practice, so helpful in, in growing our hunger for God and growing uh, His work in our lives. So go for it. Let's pray and worship together this week through the week of prayer. Right, this week, um, is like last week I said these two weeks are going to be important for us as a church. I'm not going to base them in specifically one passage. Hopefully scripture is going to come through all of them. But this week and last week I felt and we felt as elders are very significant weeks just to, to kind of distill what we feel God is doing in us as a community through this time. I said last week that looking back on our history as a church, our history is only 10 years, it's not that long, but looking back at the last 10 years, we feel God has been so amazing to us. We believe God has done so much. There's so much to be grateful for. But about two years ago, two and a half years ago, God spoke to us about being on a tipping point as a church. Are we going to tip forward into the plans and purposes he's got for us and embrace what he's doing, even if it's quite different to what we leave behind? Or are we going to go, oh, no, we just want to hold on to what we've got. And in doing so, actually tip back. But in doing so, also decline and ultimately miss out on the purposes God has got for us. And so as we were believing God was speaking to us about this as elders, we were like, yes, we want to tip forward into the plans and purposes of God. Just the wholehearted, like, yes. 
And so we felt God speak to us about some changes, about kind of a building or buildings in the city center of The Hague, about a building to serve the church and through the church serve the city from. We've also felt God speaking to us about multiplication, about what has been one church in the center of The Hague actually becoming a number of churches in The Hague and using the, langu- the Dutch language to more effectively reach more people with the good news of Jesus. And these things are so exciting, man. I've been super pumped about them. I've been like, maybe it's this, maybe it's this. Let's check out this building. Maybe it's this building. We've been pushing on doors, but for the last two years, all of those doors have remained closed to us. And it's kind of like as we've got to this COVID time, COVID has accelerated this, uh, the COVID regulations and all their implications have accelerated the sense of God doing a work in us of changing some things, of shifting some things. And we feel, I feel that this is a very important time that God has deliberately not opened some of these things that we've pushed on because he's saying, Redeemer, I want to teach you some stuff first that's going to be very, very important. That as I do open doors for building and buildings, as I do open doors for multiplication for you, you're going to step through those doors a bit different to how you are now, because I want to teach you some very important things first. And so while we're always going to be learning from God and we're always a work in progress, we'll never be the finished product. I feel like God has really been speaking to us about church community life with this kind of narrow focus on church community life. And the more I've looked into it and and thought about it, the more we've prayed about it, thought like, man, this is a really big deal for us. And so last week I talked about church community life being made up of two basic things. The first is the gospel-centered relationships that God calls us to as Christians, particularly within a local church. It's the one anothering of the New Testament. The 59 times that one anothering is used bringing a specific command to do or not to do, but like it's the love one another, serve one another, um, bear one another's burdens, submit to one another, pray for one another, show hospitality to one another. It's the one anothering of scripture, the way we relate to Christians in all of life, particularly within a local church. That's the one basic foundation of church community life. And the other is closely related because it's these um, Christians held together within a local church by gospel-centered relationships, regularly gathering. This is the gathering aspect, regularly gathering to worship and pray, to come under the authority of the preached word of God, to gather to recognize biblical leadership, to share communion with each other. It's these communal moments of gathering together. So one another in gospel-centered relationships and gathering. And uh, I said last week I'll speak about this one and this week I'll speak about this one. As I speak about the gathering this week, I'm going to quite often refer back to the one anothering because they're so closely related to each other. And I also just want to tell you, I'm, I'm going to be quite challenging at moments because I believe God wants to challenge us. God wants to speak to us. God wants to change us. Sometimes when we come to the Bible, it's like, mm, this is, man, this is so encouraging. I just feel the love and grace and mercy and acceptance of God. And sometimes we come to scripture and we go, oh, this is like heart surgery. Oh man, this is painful, but it's good because God's doing a deep work. And I'm, I feel like God's been doing a deep work in me and he still is. And I want to share that with you. And so, uh, man, I, th- I think God's going to be working in us. And I- It's going to cut quite close to the bone because for us personally and as a church, this aspect of church community life is huge. For some of us personally through this season of COVID regulations, we've we've kind of withdrawn from community life, sometimes for very good reasons. Uh, Maybe the health of a vulnerable member of the family, maybe, maybe it's fearfulness and and things, but but we with we have withdrawn from church community life, and some of us as individuals have just got a bit stuck. I believe God wants to unstick you today. 
for us as a church as we think about the future and maybe you're like me I just get excited thinking about the future I'm like thinking of buildings and church plants and like man this is amazing but I feel like I need to and we need to learn about church community life because if we don't have the basis of the one anothering and the regular gathering our, our, our vision of the future is going to be buildings and services and God goes no it's people it's people and actually, I think God's much more excited about communities of Christians, churches with, with vibrant gospel-centered hearts where people are connected together, uh, one anothering well and, and committed to regular gathering with each other. I think God's more excited about groups of believers like that that are living and sharing the gospel of Jesus than he is about physical buildings or services. Now, I think physical buildings and services can be a wonderful outworking of this community. But if we skip over what God wants to speak to us about church community life, and we just think that we're going to be preoccupied with buildings and services, and God doesn't want us to do that. So, God's called us last week, connections to one another. And this week, God's called us to be regularly gathering with each other. Hebrews 10 verse 24 and 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Here we go. There's the one another. What does it say next? Verse 25. Not giving up meeting together as some of you are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. The meeting together is so incredibly important. It's not just living in Christian community of going, man, we're connected with these group of Christians. We love each other. We're praying for one another. We like hang out together. We eat meals together. We like share with one another. We're really radical. Do you meet together in in kind of context of worship and prayer and preaching and, and to recognize biblical leadership? No, 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 we don't do that, but we do do this. No, you can't do this in the Bible without this also being in play. And you can't do this without this being effective. And Hebrews, this passage in Hebrews wonderfully brings the two together. Throughout the New Testament, we see churches gathering. They, they're meeting together. Sometimes it's just thrown, like, thrown these throwaway verses, 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Paul is giving instructions on what these services should look like. And he says, what should we say then, brothers and sisters? When you come together, each of you has a hymn, a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue or an interpretation. It's like, hey, listen, yeah, when you come together, there's just this expectation that that as Christians connected to one another in local churches, we come together. It's, it's regular. It's not if by any chance you come together. No, 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 no. When you come together, it's regular. You're meeting together regularly. This is what it looks like. And it's gathering um, regularly to specific places to be able to gather with each other. I think this, this purpose and intention of, of regularly gathering together is so incredibly important because um, the New Testament just kind of pumps with this connection between these two things. That when you come together, there's so many in instructions in the New Testament about what coming together looks like and the use of spiritual gifts and, and stuff. It, it's just like it's assumed that these two things belong together and that as Christians, we're devoted to this. The fellowship, the word fellowship in the New Testament speaks in a sense of both of them. In Acts 2, it talks about they were devoted to fellowship, devoted to one another, but also devoted to being with one another, to, to gathering with one another. And this seems pretty clear in Scripture, the, the gathering together. I mean, that's, it's short, but you just need to open the, message, the, the pages of the New Testament and you see over and over again either the story of them gathering together to pray, to worship, to, to listen to preaching, or you just see instructions of what should happen when you gather together. So it, it's, it's really clear in Scripture. And yet, for both of these things that are so clear in the New Testament, we find that in our day and age, it's not that easy to live them out. It's not that easy to, 
to kind of just go, oh, that's easy. We can just one another really well with other Christians in our local church and we gather regularly. For many of us, we find this actually much more difficult than we realize or than we'd like to admit. We may go, well, that's all true, but it just doesn't really work out like that in my life. And I, I want to... I want to push up against some things that I believe are real barriers holding us back from the type of church community life that God's called us to. The first barrier is this. Some of us are just not part of a local church. There's never been a community of believers that, or there isn't presently a community of believers that you've connected with in a local church and you've stuck up your hand and said, hey, God's adding me in here. Can you count me in? I want to be a part of the body. I, I want to be connected to what God's doing here. I want to, I, I want to be a part of the, the, the work of God Almighty in this group of people. Count me in. If, if you've just been an attender of churches, maybe you've gone really regularly, you've just attended, but there's never been a moment of stepping in and saying, count me in. We call that membership in Redeemer. But whether it's called membership or whatever, that doesn't really matter. But it's this element of being connected into a local church. You can't be a Christian and not be connected to other believers in a local church. There's no such thing as being an independent Christian for your whole life. God wants you to be connected. And so for some of you, you have resisted this or you haven't experienced the one anothering in the regular gathering because you've never actually committed to being part of a local church. Maybe today is a moment God's just saying to you, come on, I've called you to step in. Don't stand on the outside any longer. I think for some of us, uh, a big thing is that we, we may acknowledge yeah yeah there's kind of one anothering in regular gathering but i don't know if it's really that important because during covid i haven't been able to attend a church uh, like physical gathering and i haven't been that connected with other christians and you know what i'm kind of okay i haven't stopped being a christian or anything i'm i'm okay i've watched some of the services i've got up and in my pjs flicked on youtube and and watched and if I felt lonely, I've kind of hugged the TV afterwards because that's my connection to church community. But like, to be honest, I haven't really felt like I've missed out. Man, I think this is quite a few of us. I think if Redeemer had to fully regather now, as we, like if there were no restrictions, we just said, right, Redeemer's regathering. I think we might be significantly smaller than we were before because I think for a whole lot of people, we've kind of just thought, I don't think it's that important. And yes, I believe the Bible. And yes, what you're saying might be in the Bible. But I think the Bible says some other stuff, which is not that important. It's maybe for the, those days, not these days. And I can connect through YouTube and listen to preachers and yeah, have coffee with Christian mates. I just don't think it's that important. I think some of us have bought into the lie that we don't really need it that it's not that important. And I, I, just, I just want for you today that the Holy Spirit would reveal to you how incredibly important it is. Here's a big one for us. I think for many of us, the, the thing that has been holding us back from uh, church community, one anothering and regular gathering is not so much that we don't think it's important. It's that we think we're too busy. And so busyness becomes this major blocking factor. And I just want to challenge this right away because I don't think it's busyness. I think it's priorities. I think that we make time for that which is important to us. If we say, I, I, I know it's important, but I'm not really engaging in community. I'm not regularly there on connecting on Sundays because I'm just busy. It's kind of saying it's not my fault. It's, it's busyness's fault. And I think like the harsh light of day is no, it's priorities and you choose the priorities that you go for. Now I'm saying this with a smile on my face and you might be going, whoa, that's, ah, whoa, can we watch something else? You might be doing that and listen, you're welcome to flick the channel, but I, this challenge is there for you. I just wonder whether for some of us, it's actually about a reordering of priorities in our lives. 
and for maybe you think my work is super busy maybe you think my family life is super busy with work and kids and sport and like other important things and friends and like do you know what if i can just fit in my christian stuff when i want to and just watch stuff on youtube when i when i'm free that's okay i'm kind of i like that and and i just believe god wants to challenge our priorities now i felt like for some of us our kids uh, God just wants to reveal to us about the, the, the modeling for our kids of what the decisions that we're making, the priorities that we make. I had this hit home recently, so I felt like God challenging me about my technology usage, how often I'd be on my phone. And I was thinking at the same time, I'm super frustrated with how kind of my kids are so drawn towards phones and stuff. And so they're sitting on phones. I'd be like, guys, get off your phones. And I'd be looking at my phone while I'm telling them to get off their phones and thinking what I'm saying is quite different to what I'm modeling and what I'm modeling is really important. And for some of us, maybe we haven't, uh, we haven't, well, put it this way. We've said, hey, kids, come, church is important. And the kids go, okay, that's what you say, but we don't really, we kind of put a, a lot of other stuff before church. And, and what we do models to our kids much more important than what we say. It, it seems like, Dad, we only go when there's something else that's not happening. And it's like, oh, wow, actually, maybe there's some priority stuff in my own life. Or, or going, hey, kids, church community is important. And they go, really? Because, like, we don't really seem to ever hang out with other Christians from church or like we're, we don't really have people in our home and like share meals and I don't think we ever go to other people for meals and and we go oh yeah man I wonder whether our words and our actions are lining up with this some of you might right now go well no no that's because no one ever invites me it's it's not I don't want us to get stuck on that because like you're responsible for you not responsible for others and actually I want our kids thinking for ourselves our family I want our kids to grow up just going man mom and dad prioritize this stuff there's whether whether you get invited back or not for things no it's like what do we as a family give ourselves to I just want for us as families in the church those who have families that for your kids to grow up going mom and dad were radically committed to Jesus and in being committed to Jesus they were committed to one anothering with other Christians and they were committed to gathering regularly uh, for church services for prayer meetings for other things here's another one I'm not holding back here most some of you go man could seriously we should have flicked channels a little while ago but there's more here we go some of us resist this because we're not sure whether there's anything really that we can add to community. We're going like, I like the idea of community and I'm looking from the outside going, that looks great. That one anothering stuff and the, the regular gathering, maybe I'll rock up on Sundays sometimes, but like the one anothering, I'm just not sure. I'm not sure I can really add anything to that. I just feel like I don't have anything to offer. I'm, I'm kind of too small to make a difference. I just want to say two things to you. Firstly, if you think you're too small to make a difference, you've never spent a night in a room with a mosquito. But more importantly than that, you've missed God's heart for you. That God connects us in, in 1 Peter, it talks about this. God connects us as living stones to one another to be built into a spiritual house. God connects us as living stones. I love this. It's like God connects us to one another, not, not as bricks where everyone has to be the same and everyone looks the same, but it's living stones. Everyone's got a unique shape and size and God puts us in the right place and God has put stuff in you. My dear friend, if you're thinking I'm just too small to make a difference, I don't know what I have to offer. Almighty God lives in you and he created you and he loves you and he's put gifts in you that are not just for you. And I don't want the community, the church community to miss out because you don't think you have anything to give. You've got so much to give and it's going to look different from different people. You know why? Because you're not a brick. You're a stone. You're a living stone. It's got unique shape that God is wanting to add in to the building where God, where God is doing it, where God is building some of us don't 
add into community because we hold back thinking this is safer. I don't want to get hurt. And I acknowledge that church life when it goes, when things go wrong can be incredibly painful. And Some of you may have been hurt and therefore you think I'm just not going to step into that anymore. So that, that, that's a reality for, for some of us. Some of you might be thinking very practically, I, I signed up once for a life group. I kind of took that step in Redeemer to connect in and, and I never heard back. If that's the case, man, I'm so sorry. This does happen. When it happens, I'm like, ah, no. And it happens for a whole lot of reasons. Sometimes an email address was wrong. Sometimes a box of, yes, you can contact me because of privacy regulations. You have to tick a box and it doesn't get ticked. And other times it's like just falls through the cracks in our in our administration. For whatever reason, I'm super sorry if that's ever happened. Please don't hold back, but please step in and go for it. Uh, you give us a second chance to help you get connected. And sometimes we just resist community because we're selfish. And because the, the, our, the sinful tendency of our hearts towards what's in it for me, what can I get out of this, uh, what do I like, what suits me, how can I benefit, just holds us back from something which actually looks like we're going to need to sacrifice, we're going to need to give ourselves to others. My dear friends, what's holding you back from stepping in to being committed to a group of people, from joining a life group, from, from opening up your life with others, to be connected in one another in gospel-centered relationships? What's holding you back from going, man, we are just going to, we are going to commit to gathering. We're going we're gonna to put that as, first, as a first priority. We're going to work around sport and other stuff and just go, kids, we're, we're not going to be legalistic about this. It doesn't mean that you can never do sport on a Sunday because it interferes with church. It's just going, but this is priority for us. We're, we're going to give ourselves. This is going to be our default position. We're going to gather together with God's people on a Sunday. We're drawing to an end and I don't want you to feel like, man, I just felt like I, I was in a <laughs> boxing ring getting pummeled there. Uh, that was a great preach of if you want to get beaten up. Th this is not about going, hey, come on, sort yourself out. This is about going, man, God wants to speak to us and, and God wants to draw us to himself and God wants to work in us for his glory and our good. And so we don't get that way by, come on, change your attitude. We get that way by coming to Jesus and receiving his grace and his empowering by the Holy Spirit. You see, gathering to Jesus is, is at the basis of gathering to one another. Gathering to Jesus comes first before we learn to one another and before we learn to meet regularly. It's gathering to Jesus which is at the center. And the, the story of the Christian is that once we were in darkness, we were in spiritual darkness, what the Bible calls the dominion of darkness. We were dead in our sins. And yet Jesus loved us. And I love what it says. He removed us, took us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Like we become new creations. God puts a new heart, a new identity in us. As our sins are forgiven, as our sins are washed clean, God makes us completely new. We used to be enemies of God, now we're friends of God. We used to be separate from God, and now we're sons and daughters of God. And it's nothing because of our own stuff. It's nothing because of our own good works. It's purely because of His grace and His love. And, and Jesus as our, as our Savior and Lord means that Jesus, everything I am, is now devoted to you. Jesus, you are the number one in my life. I'm not just giving you my spiritual life as if I could. I'm giving you everything. Jesus, I, my whole life is in your hands. And we find that as we do that, God, God begins to work in us and change us. And he goes, I love you just as you are, but I love you so much. I'm not going to leave you as you are. I'm going to change you and I'm going to add you into a community of people who are also like you, imperfect, but following me. And I'm going to connect you 
together with them. I'm going to work in you for the rest of your life and I'm going to do that in the context of putting you into community. You're going to learn a lot about yourself and you're going to learn a lot about me because I'm going to connect you with others that you're going to bash up against and you're going to bless and encourage one another and at times you're going to hurt one another. But as you do that, I'm going to give you the opportunity to exercise the spiritual muscles that I'm giving you of forgiveness and and love and care and bearing one another's burdens and muscles that would otherwise not be able to be exercised, but in the gym of connectedness and are going to need to be exercised a lot. God calls us to be radically devoted to one another in our devotion to him. And that's what I'm calling you to. That's what as leaders of Redeemer, we're saying, come on, let's grow in this one another and get part of a life group. Be connected. Don't just attend on Sundays occasionally, but like be connected. What what is God doing? I'm going to be, I I rejoice, David says, when they said, let's go to the house of the Lord. I want to be, I want to be signing up whenever I can to be part of one of the meetings. And when I'm not in the newer kirk, I'm going to be engaging online and I'm just going to give myself to this. This is our desire for you. My dear friends, if you've never come to Jesus and and given your life to him, this is a moment you can do that. I want to invite you firstly into a relationship with Jesus. And you can do that just by coming before him and saying, Jesus, I, I don't have anything I can bring to the party here. There's nothing in me that makes me worthy of your love. But I come and say, God, will you accept me? Will you forgive my sin? Will you make me new? And God will do that. And then he'll take you on the adventure of knowing and loving him. And if you realize there have been some barriers that have stopped you engaging as God wants us to engage in community. Today's just the day of saying, God, I'm so sorry. I've, I've believed that lie. I've bought into that way of thinking. God, will you change me? Will you renew me? And God, will you take me on the adventure of being part of a church community. What an adventure. Dear friends, I can't wait to see you next week.